Okay. So they give you the best rifle in the world. So what? Me? I'm sick of monkeying around. What I want to know is, when do we get to shoot this M1? I heard a man in this company say that yesterday. And I've got a hunch a lot of you feel the same way. So, I want to answer the question now. You'll start shooting the M1 when you're ready. And that means when you've mastered the groundwork, we're teaching you in this course. You've had sighting and aiming, firing positions, trigger squeeze, and the principles of rapid fire. We've been training your eyes and your muscles for the job of shooting. And now your brains are going to get a workout. So this is a skull practice session. We'll take elevation and windage. I'm going to show you how to raise or lower your sights to take care of the natural drop of your bullet and how to move your sights right or left to allow for the effect of the wind on your bullet's path to the target. Look at the sights on your rifles. Your front sight is fixed and your rear sight is movable. It has two knobs, the windage knob to move it from side to side and the elevating knob to move it up and down. Turn these knobs. You notice that they don't rotate freely. They click as you twist them and those clicks are important. For each click, your sight moves an exact distance. And that's the way you keep track of the adjustments you make. All right, let's talk about elevation first. If you've ever thrown or hit or caught a baseball, you know the principle of elevation. You know that no matter how fast it's traveling, a baseball keeps falling all the time it's in the air. The farther it goes, the farther and faster it falls. Exactly the same thing is true of a bullet. Well then, suppose you're firing at a target 300 yards away and you make no allowance for the fall of the bullet. Suppose that when it leaves the muzzle of your rifle, the bullet's heading straight for the center of the bullseye. But it drops. It starts to fall as soon as it leaves your rifle, and it keeps on falling. The distance it falls in the first few yards isn't worth worrying about. But at 300 yards, your bullet will drop 20 inches or more. It'll drop right off the bullseye. You've got to tilt your rifle up a little to allow for that drop. Suppose you raise your rear sight, but you keep our old friend the correct sight picture. The line of aim must always be the same. So, setting your rear sight higher makes you tilt your rifle up. The higher your rear sight, the higher the tilt of your rifle. Do you get that? When you adjust your rear sight for elevation, you simply fix the exact amount you're going to tilt your rifle. That means how much you're going to raise or lower the hit of your bullet on the target. And since your front sight is fixed and your rear sight stays where you set it, you make precisely the same allowance for every shot you fire. And that's where the elevating knob clicks come in. As I told you, each click moves your rear sight up or down an exact distance. When you change your rear sight, then, you tilt your rifle a corresponding amount. And this moves the hit of your bullet on the target a distance in exact proportion to the movement of your rear sight. At 100 yards, one click of elevation moves the hit of your bullet on the target up or down one inch. At 200 yards, one click moves it two inches. At 300 yards, three inches. And so on. That's what the book means when it says one click of the elevating knob moves the strike of the bullet one inch on the target for each 100 yards of range. To move the hit of the bullet up, raise the rear sight. To move it down, 
lower the rear sight. And that's all there is to it. Now, let's see if you've got that. You're firing at this target at 200 yards. Your first shot hits 10 inches low. What are you going to do about it? Thompson? Sir, at, at 200 yards, each click raises the bullet two inches. So you take five clicks to raise it 10 inches. Right. One more. Your range is 500. You've made too big an allowance, and your first shot strikes five inches too high. What do you do about it? Hopper. Sir, five inches at 500? You'd have to bring the rear sight down. Why, uh, just one click. Right again. Each click moves the strike of the bullet one inch for each hundred yards. You all see that? All right. Let's move on to windage. You may have heard that windage is tough, but don't let it throw you. It's no more mysterious than elevation. There may be a few more things to keep in your head, but take it easy and you won't have any trouble with it. Now, you might find it hard to believe that the wind can have much effect on anything as small and fast moving as a bullet, but you can take my word for it. Any wind, unless it's coming from straight behind you or straight in front of you, is going to blow your bullet off its course. Take it as we did elevation. Suppose you're firing at 300 yards and you make no allowance for the wind. Suppose that when the bullet leaves the muzzle of your rifle, it's heading straight for the center of the bullseye. But there's a wind from your right. That wind keeps pushing your bullet to the left, forcing it off your line of sight and off the target. Once again, you've got to make an allowance. You've got to start your bullet off to the right of your line of aim so that the force of the wind will push it over into the bullseye. In other words, you've got to point your rifle into the wind. If you were shooting an old-time squirrel rifle with fixed sights, you'd have to guess at windage correction. You'd have to sort of aim into the wind a little. Fetch a jug of corn. You can't get that dark crow that's one through the hay. You're on. Quite smart wind to I guess she'd take about five inches off toward the right. That's what we call taking Kentucky windage. Aiming each shot into the wind by guesswork. And if you had nothing better than a hillbilly rifle, that's what you'd have to do. But you've got an M1 rifle. And it's a different story. It's true, you have to start with a guess at the effect of the wind. And we'll show you some tricks about making your guess accurate. But with the M1, you've got a movable rear sight. And you take right windage by moving it to the right. Left windage by moving it to the left. Then when you've made your adjustment, you line up your sights on the target, taking the same sight picture you always do. But now, you're not sighting straight down along the rifle barrel. And as a result, you angle your rifle to one side. The farther to the right or left, you move your sight. The farther to the right or left, you point your rifle. Do you see that? Well then, when you adjust your sights for windage, you simply determine how much to the right or left you're going to point your rifle. Once you set your sights, they stay put. So, till the wind changes and you have to make a different allowance, you can be sure you've got the same angle every time. How about those clicks in the windage knob? Like the clicks of elevation, each click of windage Moves your rear sight right or left an exact distance. As a result, 
You angled your rifle, right or left, a corresponding amount. And that changes the strike of the bullet on the target, a distance in exact proportion to the movement of your rear sight. So it all boils down to this. One click of the windage knob moves the strike of the bullet one inch for each hundred yards of range. At 100 yards, one click to the right moves the strike of the bullet one inch to the right. At 200 yards, it moves it two inches. At 300 yards, three inches, and so on. Let's see if you understand that. Your range is 300 yards. You fire a trial shot, which strikes a target nine inches too far to the right. Which way will you move your rear sight? Right or left? Keen? Sir, you've got to move the bullet to the left. So you move your sight to the left. Correct. You move your rear sight in the direction you want to move your head. You take left windage. Now, there's an error of nine inches at 300 yards. How many clicks of left windage do we need? Fine. At 300 yards, well, one click moves at three inches, so you take three clicks left windage, don't you, sir? You do. Any questions? Okay. Suppose your shot hit six inches to the left of center. What would be your correction if the range were 200 yards? Paul? Sir, at 200, one click would be two inches. So it'd be three clicks, right windage, to move the hit to the right. Good. Three clicks, right windage, to move the hit six inches right at 200 yards. Now, your target is at 500 yards. Your hit is 10 inches right of center. What's the correction? Murphy? Two clicks left windage, sir, because it's five inches per click for 500 yards. Excellent. Now, what about that wind you're going to allow for? How can you guess? How can you be fairly sure in advance what effect the wind is going to have on your shooting? There are some good tricks to it, and they're not hard to learn. To begin with, I don't have to tell you that there are two things about any wind that are important. One's its speed, and the other is its direction. In the Army, we always speak about wind directions by the clock system. It's simple and convenient. Imagine yourself in the middle of the face of a big clock. Directly in front of you is 12 o'clock. Then 3 o'clock to your right. And 9 o'clock to your left. 6 o'clock straight behind you. And the other hours are in between. We name a wind by the hour it's blowing from. A wind from directly in front is a 12 o'clock wind. From the right, a 3 o'clock wind. From behind, a 6 o'clock wind. And so on, around the clock. 1 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 11 o'clock wind. The Lord knows that's easy. Just remember, you're always in the middle facing 12 o'clock, and the rest's a pushover. So we come to the other important factor, the velocity or speed of a wind. We measure the speed in miles per hour, and your common sense is enough to tell you that a 10-mile wind will have twice as much effect on a bullet as a 5-mile wind from the same direction. But how are you going to figure out a wind's speed? Well, the best thing to have is plenty of experience. An old-timer can just look at a wind and feel it on his face and give you a close estimate of its speed. But not many of you have the experience it takes. So, you'll just have to figure it out. You can get some help by using your eyes. Watch what the wind does to grass or trees or dust or smoke or anything else it's blowing. At first, 
That won't tell you much about the wind speed in miles per hour. But you'll be surprised how soon you'll get the feel of it. In the meantime, there are a couple of simple rules that you can use. Here's one. Take something light, like dust or a blade of grass. Toss it into the air and watch where it falls. Point with your whole arm from the shoulder at that spot. Then estimate the angle between your arm and your body. Most of you know that a right angle is 90 degrees. When you hold your arm out straight then, the angle between your arm and your body is 90 degrees. All right. I'm pointing at the spot where the grass fell. My arm is a little less than halfway up, so I'll say the angle under it is 40 degrees. Got that? If this is a 90 degree angle, this is a 40. Now then, the rule is that you divide the angle under your arm by four to get the speed of the wind in miles per hour. Don't ask me why. Somebody made it up before my time and didn't tell me why. But I know it's near enough right to work. One quarter of the angle between your arm and your body gives you the speed of the wind. All right, if this is a 40 degree angle, What's the speed of the wind? Lewis? Four into 40 is 10, sir. 10 miles per hour. Right. The angle between your arm and your body divided by four is the wind velocity in miles per hour. If my blade of grass fell there, what's the wind speed? Carol? That's a little more than halfway up, sir. About 60 degrees. Right. 60 degrees? What's the speed of the wind? Four into 60 is uh, 15, 15 miles an hour. Okay. Remember that. One quarter of the angle between the arm and the body. There's another rule of thumb. Or really, it's the same rule applied in a different way. You take the whole angle between your body and your arm when it's straight out and divide it into five equal parts. Then each of these parts represents a wind speed of five miles per hour. You see what I mean? You toss your dust or your blade of grass or whatever it is, just as you did before, and point to the spot where it falls. Then you work it out this way. Five miles per hour, 10 miles per hour, 15 miles per hour. Questions? Of course, you won't always have to work the wind out for yourself. This man's army believes in cooperation. If somebody knows the wind speed already, ask him. On the range, ask the man ahead of you. In battle, ask the next man down the line. And if anybody asks you, tell him. Only, don't tell him unless you know what you're talking about. Well, now you know how to designate wind direction and how to figure wind speed. You're able to get the information you need to set your sights for the effect of the wind. How are you going to turn this information into clicks of your windage knob? One way is to refer to windage diagrams in your scorebook. These charts work out the corrections for you and will be explained in detail by your platoon leaders. But you don't take your scorebooks into battle. In a scrap, you estimate your wind, do the figuring in your head, and set your sights, but quick. So learn how to do it now, while you've still got time to think about it, and get your questions answered. Ready? Hold on to your hats. Here we go. Here's the one-click windage rule. Range in hundreds of yards times wind velocity in miles per hour divided by 10 equals the number of clicks of wind allowance you've got to take for three and nine o'clock winds. Now, don't let that scare you. It's not as tough as it sounds. For instance, when it says the range in hundreds of yards, 
All it means is that you throw the two zeros away. When your range is 300, you'll call it a 3. 500, a 5. 200, a 2. And so on. The wind in miles per hour is what we've just been talking about. It'll turn out to be some perfectly harmless number like 8 or 12 or 18 or 20. So, relax. That whole business, the range in hundreds of yards, times the velocity of the wind in miles per hour, is going to turn out to be easier than the arithmetic you did in school when you were 10 years old. It'll be about as hard as multiplying 3 times 15. You know your range. Say it's 500 yards. Well, that's five. Your wind's from three o'clock. You estimated speed. Say, eight miles an hour. So you've got to multiply five times eight. It's as tough as that. Five times eight is 40. And that's the first half of this problem. Now, We've got to divide by 10. If you've ever been exposed to simple decimals, you know how hard that is. You point off one place from the right. If the last digit happens to be a zero, just chuck it away. And there's your problem. You multiplied five for 500 yards times eight for eight miles per hour and you got 40. Now, we have to divide by 10. In other words, we have to knock off that last zero. And the answer was four. So four is the number of clicks of wind allowance you must take. Now, we've been talking about three and nine o'clock winds. Think of your clock again. Three and nine o'clock winds hit the bullet directly from the side. What about two, four, eight, and 10 o'clock winds. That is, the winds within one hour on each side of three and nine o'clock. These winds are not directly from one side or the other, but they're so close you don't bother about the differences. In other words, the rule holds for all winds that are generally from the side. You make no allowance at all for six and 12 o'clock winds because they do not blow the bullet out of line. So what winds does that leave us? It leaves one and five and seven and 11 o'clock winds, which are two hours away from three and nine o'clock. They strike the bullet only a glancing blow and affect it only about half as much. So for them, you take half as many clicks of windage. Here it is, all in one rule. Range in hundreds of yards times wind velocity in miles per hour divided by 10 equals the number of clicks of windage correction. Use full correction for 2, 3, 4, 8, 9, and 10 o'clock winds. Use one half of that correction for 1, 5, 7, and 11 o'clock winds. Use no correction for 6 and 12 o'clock winds. And there it is. Now I'll do one more problem for you. Your range is 300 yards. Your wind is coming from 8 o'clock. And you estimate its speed to be 12 miles an hour. That's three to begin with. Times 12 equals 36. Divided by 10, three and six tenths. Am I in trouble? I can't take six tenths of a click. What am I going to do? I'm going to take four clicks. That's the rule. 
One full click for any fraction you have left over in figuring. If your answer were two and two tenths, you take three clicks. If it were five and eight tenths, you take six. You take one full click for any fraction left over. All right. Let's see if you can work it out. Range 200 yards. Your wind's a nine o'clock wind and an estimated speed of nine miles per hour. Now, how are you going to work out the number of clicks of windage? I'll write it down. You tell me what to do. Range 200. What shall I put down? Tobin? Two, sir. Right. Your wind's from nine o'clock. You estimate its speed at nine miles per hour. What do I put down? Two times nine, sir. That's 18. Right. How many clicks do you take? 18 divided by 10, that's uh, one and eight tenths, sir. Right. Now, how many clicks? Two clicks, sir. Left windage. Good. Two clicks left because a nine o'clock wind is from the left. Now, suppose the wind has been from seven o'clock instead of nine. Which windage would you take? Left or right? Macmillan. Left, sir. Seven's on the left. Correct. Tobin took two clicks for a nine o'clock wind. What would you take for a seven o'clock wind? One click, sir. Because seven's is two hours away from nine. So you take only half as much. Good. Do you all see that? Now, here's another. Your range is 500 yards. Your wind's from one o'clock. And your estimated speed is 12 miles an hour. Peters. Five times 12, sir, 60. Good, you're way ahead of me. Then what? Divide 60 by 10, uh, throw away the zero, gives us six. But um, a uh, one o'clock wind takes only one half the number of clicks. So it's three clicks. Good. Which windage? Right windage, sir. That's right, you've got it. I used to teach mathematics, sir. <laughs> well, it doesn't take a professor to do this simple figuring. Now, you're on a range, 300 yards. You win some four o'clock. Speed 15. Carinetti. Uh, sir, that's three times 15, that's 45, sir. Right. Three times 15 is 45. Now what? Then you divide by 10, sir. Uh, that makes four and a half. Good. How many clicks of windage? Well, like you said, sir, a guy can't take a half a click, so they'd make five clicks, sir. Good again. Five clicks of which windage? Right, sir. Right is right. 
Now, you men seem to have this pretty straight. How about it? Any questions? Good. Only be sure to remember all this. If any questions bother you, ask them. Now we'll cover all the ground we've gone over so far. We started out with elevation. We saw that when you raise your rear sight, you have to tilt your rifle to line up properly on the target. We saw that one click of elevation moves the strike of your bullet on the target one inch for each hundred yards of range. Then we went to windage. We saw that when you move your rear sight to one side or the other, you have to angle your rifle off to the side to line up on the target. We saw that one click of windage moves the strike of the bullet one inch right or left for each hundred yards of range. We went into designating wind directions by the clock. The wind is called by the hour it comes from. I showed you the tricks of estimating your wind speed. Throw some light substance into the air and point your arm at the spot where it falls. Then figure the angle between your arm and your body. And that angle divided by four is your wind speed in miles per hour. Or divide the angle into five equal parts and say each part, as your arm is raised, represents five miles an hour wind speed. And that gave you the information you need to calculate your windage. Then we took the formula here, the one-click windage rule, and saw how it worked. I don't mind telling you that I'm mighty pleased about the way you followed it all. Elevation and windage are very important things for a rifleman to understand. But what's just as important is the fact that you didn't lose your heads. Men who keep their heads are the kind of soldiers who are making Tojo and Hitler sorry they started this fight. <laughs>